So here we are, again, Christmas Sunday. And uh, as we get ready to look at this passage in Luke chapter 2, um, I, I think about some of the ways in which my family and I have been experiencing Christmas so far. And uh, having the chance to have three small children, one who's in first grade, one who's a four-year-old, another one that is, you know, just figuring out how to talk. It's a fun age to try to instill in them these truths about the Lord, these truths about the Word of God, especially as we celebrate Christmas, because Christmas is such a widespread uh, celebration all throughout society. Uh, we have folks who might not know who Jesus is that still celebrate Christmas. Uh, we, ha we might have folks that, that are not very religious, they might say, but they still celebrate Christmas. And so it's a great opportunity to engage with our families and to talk about the real meaning of Christmas. In fact, this past Wednesday night, we had our annual Christmas program here in the sanctuary. We had a packed house and had a wonderful opportunity to hear the Christmas story told from the perspective of our kids. And uh, through their various lines, they allowed us to, to understand and hear about the true meaning of Christmas. So as a pastor, I looked at my kids, especially the two older ones, and I said, hey, Joseph and Ruth, what is Christmas really all about, right? Because we've been going to the stores and we've been watching the movies that have been coming out. There's some really good ones that have been coming out. I don't know if you've seen that one called Noel. That's a recent one that came out. Um, so we had a chance to see that on uh, Disney Plus. Anybody have, have, has tapped into Disney Plus just yet? Um, we don't have our own, but we're borrowing our friend's subscription. You could judge me later if you want. It's called sharing, which is what this season is all about. Anyway, for those who are judging me, um, so we, you know, we, we like the movies and everything, but I asked the kids, I said, Joseph, Ruth, what is Christmas really all about? And I was just kind of holding my breath to see what these pastor's kids would say, right? in response to that question and they looked and they both looked at us and uh bringing much joy to my heart and to drea's heart they said the real meaning of christmas dad is to celebrate the birth of jesus and i go yes all right we're, we're getting somewhere so then i said so what's your favorite part about christmas you know and they said getting presents and i go oh man all right <laughs> look at this guy <laughs> He's here. So I go, okay, we're halfway there. Um, at least we have the birth of Jesus, right? But we're still working on some of the other things. And so as I thought about presents and gifts, and it's something that is, uh, again, part of all of our experience. Uh, for some of us, it might be really big and elaborate. For others, it might be simple um, and humble. And yet, uh, the fact of the matter is, gifts and presents has become the... Uh, the not the reason, but has become uh, a staple and something that's to be expected around this season. And so I, I looked up just to just out of curiosity, how much money uh, was spent in the U.S. last Christmas on Christmas gifts? All right, I'm going to give you an opportunity to guess here. All right, because you you might be surprised and shocked by by this figure. Can anybody guess? about how much money in the U.S. was spent on Christmas gifts. I heard some million. I heard a couple people say billion. Five billion. Trillion. <laughs> okay. The figure is $720 billion in the U.S. alone. Not, not in the world, but just in this country Last Christmas, uh, about $720 billion was spent on Christmas. So again, that goes to show um, what is it that we say Christmas is all about, right? Um, and yes, of course, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to bash on gifts. I know we're three days away. By the way, we're three days away <laughs> uh, for those who still need to do some last-minute shopping. Uh, and there is some level of expectation that we have about gifts that we have. Um, but I do want just to kind of put into perspective the fact that we do live in a society that maybe values the commercial aspects of the season more so than the true reason for the season, who is Jesus. There's a lot of money spent on Christmas. And let's be honest, probably at least half of that is, are going to be things that will be forgotten by Christmas 2020. Things that will be broken things that will get holes, things that will get lost, 
things that will no longer carry the same value or meaning or significance because it's no longer what we're into the next year or whatever it may be. Things that maybe aren't even opened and, and left in uh, wrapped uh, for years until finally somebody going through their attic or their garage realizes, oh yeah, I did get that for Christmas back in 2019. So gifts, as much as they are uh, elevated to maybe the highest standard of what Christmas is all about, at least in, <laughs> in the minds of my, my little ones, um, there's, there's really more to this season um, than, than just those, those things, those things that we, uh, that we search online for, those things that we walk up and down aisles for. Um, uh, Christmas is much more than just about those kinds of gifts. You know, in my neighborhood yesterday, we were, um, we were, we were preparing uh, in my house uh, tamales for, for the coming year. And that was a fun, a fun party, right, uh, to get together and to work, work on that. And we were outside and walking around with the kids, and all of a sudden a car comes zooming up through my neighborhood. I'm like, man, what's going on here? This must be like an emergency or something. Guy parks on the street, and he gets out, and he's wearing a brown jumpsuit, a UPS person, not driving a UPS car, so I think they're, they're subcontracting during this season. Uh, so here he gets out of like this maroon Honda Civic, and he starts sprinting with three packages in his hands. Rings a doorbell, drops a package. I'm watching this whole thing. I'm like, this is hilarious. He, he rings the doorbell, drops a package off, and he keeps going. My neighbor comes out, and he looks out like that, and he sees this guy running. And as he's running, he turns back and goes, check your mailbox, and he keeps running. <laughs> I'm like, this guy is sprinting and yelling, and he is on the countdown as well. I'm wondering if he's got some kind of time marker that he, or maybe he just took an extra long lunch and now he's trying to make up for it. Whatever it is, this is a crazy time of the year. The malls are crazy. Stores are crazy. Parking lots are crazy. Um, man, I've even remember uh, reading news stories about people that got in fights over items um, because it was like the last item on the shelf and they, they you know somebody wants to pull a knife out um, because the other person took the last item that's a great way to say merry christmas <laughs> and by the way the pastor josh is, is confessing that that was him so what kind of gifts are your favorite as we're talking about this stuff are, do you like surprise gifts do you like to be surprised and like, you know, completely uh, astonished that what you opened was, was somehow the thing that you really wanted, uh, but, but somehow you got it by not telling anybody? I don't get how that works unless some of you have telepathy. I don't. I always tell Dre, I said, Dre, I know that you like certain things, so tell me what it is that you want so that I don't get you something that you don't, right? Because you all know that face that somebody makes when they open a gift that they're trying to be like grateful, but in reality, they're kind of like, I, I can't believe you just bought me that. Like, and I'm trying to avoid that face as much as possible, okay? Some of you give that face probably more than you, uh, you get it. Do you like surprise, or do you like to get exactly what you want? Do you like practical gifts? Okay, I, I know for me, I love practical gifts. I'm like, if I could use it and it helps to like do something that, that aligns with my life, then I'm all for it. Uh, otherwise, for me, I'm probably not going to use it. I'm like, I need something practical. So you might laugh, but it's like, if I get new underwear for Christmas, I'm going to be excited. Okay? Um, and so, okay, look at Drea's over there like, you never know. You never know. Something might be, I, mean, I get excited. Some people get offended by practical gifts. Like, you got me a toothbrush. Why'd you get me a toothbrush or floss? What are you trying to say, right? Um, do you like expensive gifts or do you like stocking stuffers? Do you like things that are bought or do you like things that are made? And then here's my last question, okay? And you don't have to answer this out loud. In fact, I would encourage you not to answer it out loud, especially if you came to church with somebody today. What's the lamest Christmas gift you ever got? <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer that question. But as we're talking about gifts... Um, the other day I, I received, I would say probably at least one, if not my favorite Christmas gift that I'll get this year. Um, I picked up Joseph from school and as he came into the car, he had this big old box and I'm like, what are you carrying a big old box from school? Like what, what, what do you do inside the first grade classroom that would cause, apparently he and all his friends had exchanged lots of gifts. And so here he is, he's bringing more candy than a first grader would ever need to have. And he's got all these little gifts, and it was cute because he made a, a special uh, 
uh, well, actually, he, he contracted my wife to make a special uh, ornament for one of his best friends in his class um, that he customized it. So then that same friend gave him a big old box full of stuff. And I'm like, man, look at this. This is cool. And then he pulls out from behind the box this giant item. And he says, Daddy, this is for you. And it's wrapped, and it says, To Dad from Joseph. And I was just like, I don't even care what's inside this thing. That's already the best gift, right? It could just be like a cardboard, you know, thing on there with, with you know, whatever. And it's already the best gift. Because my son thought about his dad and brought me a gift, and he wrapped it. I don't know if he wrapped it. It was wrapped kind of nice. And knowing my son, eh. Nevertheless, he gives it to me. And there we are, right outside of the elementary school. And he says, Dad, open it now. I'm like, oh, so I want to wait. I want to open it with Mommy so that she could see what, what her, her son gave to Daddy, right? So that she could be a little jealous of me, you know, that, that Joseph made me a gift. So, uh, so sure enough, I waited until uh, we were all together as a family. And I unwrapped it, and it's a beautiful painting that he had been working on that he made just for me. I opened it, gave him a big old hug. I'm saying, I'm putting this in my office. I was waiting for an art piece. And I was getting ready to go to a store. Now I don't have to go to a store anymore because Joseph gave me this awesome painting that I get to put up. That's the best, right? Because it's from his heart, you know. Um, and it doesn't matter how much it costs to make, um, but uh, a, a little wrapped gift like that is the best in this, in this season. Now, let me give you a definition of gift. Definition of gift is a thing given willingly to someone without payment. A thing given willingly to someone without payment. So the definition that I'm using here of gift is something that is not owed, something that someone doesn't necessarily deserve, but it's given willingly um, to someone without payment. And, and I looked at it, and there's actually another definition of gift. There's a lot of definitions of gift. But another one that I saw that was interesting was one that said the legal definition of gift. Do you want to hear the legal definition of gift? Because for tax purposes, there's actual definition of gift. And it says this. In the legal sense, the term gift refers to a definite voluntary transfer of property from one to another. The transfer must be made without any consideration, that is, without any expectation of receiving compensation in return. So the legal definition of gift is no strings attached. The legal definition of gift is transfer of property from one person to another just because. And as I think about gift and as I think about Christmas and this season that we're celebrating in a couple days, uh, we will be celebrating Christmas together. It makes me think of the gift that we have in Jesus. Uh, a, a gift that's given freely from our Heavenly Father to us without expectation of payment. Uh, the gift that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ, um, is, in fact, a gift. It doesn't have strings attached. God says, I love you so much that I'm giving you my best. I'm giving you my Son. And you don't have to do anything to earn it. You don't have to do anything to deserve it. In fact, what God tells us through the scriptures is that in spite of all the things that we've done against God, in spite of all the reasons for him to not want to give us a gift, but to give us punishment, in spite of all the reasons that God has to, to ghost us and neglect us and walk away from us, in spite of all the things that we've done to reject God, he chose not to reject us in return, but has demonstrated for us the kind of love that only God could give, that even though we were sinners and turned our back on him, he still willingly and voluntarily, without expectation of compensation, gave us the best gift that he could give, which is his son, Jesus Christ. Those are the best kinds of gifts. And that is, in fact, the first and the greatest Christmas gift of all time. Let's read Luke chapter 2. And I want to read verses 1 all the way through 20. It's a little bit of a long story, but hang in there because I do believe that it's a beautiful story. And I don't think we can ever get tired of it or read it enough. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 20. And you have it say amen? And it says this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. 
This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. That's the word of the Lord out of Luke chapter 2. We know through the four gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Matthew and Luke both carry a birth narrative of Jesus. It tells us in great length and detail the way in which Jesus came to be born. Uh, we find that Jesus was born of a virgin named Mary. We found that he was born in a town called Bethlehem. Um, there are a couple things that are different if you were to look at the Matthew uh, narrative and the Luke narrative. Uh, the Matthew narrative starts in chapter 1 with a long, extensive, and exhaustive genealogy tracing the, uh, the lineage uh, leading up to the birth of Jesus. Uh, many things that you'll notice in the lineage is that there are references to kings such as David and others. We don't have a genealogy in the story of Luke uh, for the most part, but we do have a different telling, which essentially is sharing with us the Christmas story in a different way. And today, we've chosen to focus on Luke's version of the Christmas story, the story of the birth of Jesus. And I want to just point out a few things from this story that are significant as we really uh, think about what this all meant. Uh, one of the things that strikes our attention initially when we read this passage that we even see displayed here um, on the stage is that Jesus was born and laid in a manger. Everybody say manger. So as a kid growing up in church and having been in, I don't know how many Christmas programs and plays and playing almost every role that one could play. I'm sure I've been a shepherd, maybe even a sheep at one point. I've been Joseph. I don't think I was baby Jesus, but who knows? I am a PK, so you never know. They just put you wherever they want to put you. But for whatever reason, growing up in the church, being very familiar with these stories and in fact, rehearsing lines that are straight taken straight out of scripture, I always kind of equated a manger with a crib. I don't know, is anybody with me on that? Does that ever make sense? Like when you think of a manger and the stories of a manger, because manger to me, because of being a Christian, because of being familiar with these stories, doesn't necessarily mean 
a feeding trough. A manger to me often is just kind of equated with a crib or a bassinet or something that you typically lay kids in. But let me just say that Jesus may have been the first baby to have ever been laid in a place where animals eat. Um, Jesus may have been the first baby that was ever uh, taken out to the shed um, during a, in, a, in a place where animals would lay down and would live and would eat and would do other things that they do after they eat. And I don't want to get too graphic about that. But Jesus may have been the first child to ever been laid in something that was not meant for children to lay in. Uh, it's almost as if uh, uh, when a newborn baby comes home, uh, rather than taking them inside a house with a beautifully prepared a nursery, a room with, with, with the walls that have been painted and all of the different uh, stuffed animals and gifts that have been brought by. Rather than taking a child and placing a child there, you take the child out back behind the garage in that area where we all keep our junk that needs to be thrown away, but we haven't thrown it away for some reason and lay the baby down back there. That's kind of what it was like for Jesus to be placed in a manger. Nothing impressive, uh, nothing typical or standard about placing a baby in a manger. And it makes me think about the fact that when we read and study this story of the first Christmas, it's a story that demonstrates to us that our Savior comes from humble origins. Our Savior Jesus was placed in uh, something that others would have laughed at, but that's where the beginning of this story of who Jesus is comes from. When Jesus was placed in a manger in Bethlehem because there was no room, um, because they weren't able to make room for them and their family, the LA Times wouldn't have heard about that. New York Times wouldn't have covered that story. The Washington Post could have cared less. In fact, the beginning of this story in Luke chapter 2 talks about the global scene. It says that there was a census decreed from Rome all the way from Italy that impacted where Jesus lived because Israel during that time was a province that was under the rule of Rome. But Rome probably never heard about this birth. Rome probably never heard about a baby born in Bethlehem. In Rome, it was just another night, just another day. Uh, nothing had been reported back to Caesar Augustus that a king was born. It was quiet. And it makes me think that there were these parallel realities that are happening simultaneously. On the one hand, in Bethlehem, this beautiful story of angels coming and declaring a message to shepherds and shepherds running and spreading the news and going to actually see what was prophesied to them and seeing that. And we have this beautiful story that we've been welcomed into because of our faith and because we, we can see that there's more to this quiet night in Bethlehem than what it seems on the outside. But we also have this Rome story where it's just another night that goes by that there wasn't some kind of solar or lunar eclipse that everybody knew something special was happening and it reminds me that when we think about faith in Jesus when it when we think about what God is up to in our lives there are always these two battling realities that are happening side by side there's what God is actually doing and there's what I perceive about whether or not God is doing something in my life there's the story of, of the Lord sending his angels to encamp around me and defend me. And then there's the other story of me seeing all of the challenges and difficulties and trials that I'm experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm stuck trying to figure out which is more real. Is the problem that I'm facing more real, the issue that I'm up against more real, or is the fact that I have a God who's promised me that he is working that out, whether or not I could see the evidence of his work in that situation right here and right now. And just in the same way that we face those dueling realities in our own lives, the reality of what God is doing and who God is, and the reality of what we see and what we experience, and in the same exact way, we see that reality being battled even in this story in Luke chapter 2. Is it just a poor family who didn't have a place to stay, that couldn't afford a nice enough place? Or is it a story of God sending his son 
to be the Savior and the Messiah and the Lord and the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace and the one who's come to meet us in our brokenness, in our darkness, and to set us free from all of our sin. You see, to a particular person's eye and perspective, you have both options in front of you, option A or option B, and you can choose. And in fact, today, in this Christmas, you, church, get to choose where you are placing your trust. Are you trusting in the things of earth? Are you trusting in stuff? Are you trusting in something to bring you the happiness that you're seeking? Or are you placing your trust in a God who is at work, whether or not we could always see the evidence of that work? You see, I find that in this story, it's interesting, and I'm going to point out something as we work through these verses, that maybe even Mary and Joseph were still not yet 100% convinced of the work that God was doing in and through them in the person of Jesus. In fact, I could guarantee that there was both a combination of hope in their heart as well as doubt and fear, that they weren't too sure whether or not God was actually doing this just yet. Yes, they had seen visions. Yes, they had had dreams. But how many of us know that when we wake up in the morning after a dream, we always wonder whether or not what we experienced was actually real. And it's easy for us to then fall back into reality by being able to see that something that had been told to us may not have been the real truth. Or maybe in our lives when we see God at work around us, we can for a little while get the hope and faith that God is doing something, but then all of a sudden we experience another hardship or another tragedy or another difficulty, and then it causes us to question one more time whether or not God is actually at work. I believe in the same way Mary and Joseph were carrying this tension of hope and doubt all throughout this story. They were, they were fearful. They were wondering, is their family going to accept them? Is their family going to reject them? Are people going to believe their story about what they had seen and heard? Or are people going to accuse them of being lunatics and crazy? Are people going to accuse them of, of, uh, 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 of smoking something uh, uh, on their trip to Bethlehem and back because of all the things that they're coming back ready to say? Are people going to actually accept them and welcome them? Or are they going to be rejected? I guarantee that they had the same fears and doubts as well as the hopes through these stories. Now I find it interesting as we look at this passage and we, we just see that little subtle reference to the fact that there was no guest rooms available for them. Um, I find it interesting that Jesus later in John's gospel would look to his disciples and give them an invitation and say, in my father's house, there are many rooms. I find it interesting that someone who was rejected and not given a room then turns around and looks to you and me and says, there's a place for you in my father's house. How often in our own lives when we're burned, all of a sudden turn around and we want to give the same treatment to others because of what we've been given ourselves. Somebody called us a name, then it gives us the ability to call them that name back. If somebody wasn't there for us when we thought they should have been there for us, and then all of a sudden they need our help, how quick are we as humans in our own flesh and nature to tell them, you weren't there for me, why should I be there for you? When Jesus does the exact opposite with humanity. He could have easily said, you didn't welcome me. You didn't give me a place. I needed a room. My family needed a room. My poor parents needed a room. Nobody gave us room. Therefore, now that I'm on high, seated at the right hand, none of you are getting any room because nobody gave me room when I was a baby. Jesus, if he were acting like us, would probably have said, you don't deserve a room. And yet he demonstrates for us the character of, of Christ that so challenges our own human character and nature by saying, even though he was rejected and not given space, he turns to us and says, hey, there's space for you. In my father's house, there's plenty of room. In fact, you, Jesus says, yes, you, even you, the one who's said things about me that you shouldn't have said. Even you, the one who's rejected me all your life, and all of a sudden now you want to turn toward me. Yes, even you, there's room for you in my father's house. 
Remember Jesus, even on the cross, as he turned toward the criminals that were to his left and to his right, even though he himself was perfect and sinless in every way and promised to the one of them that asked him that he would be with Jesus in paradise that very day. The generosity of God is on display in the life of Jesus. He doesn't harbor grudges or resentment like we do. And therefore, we need to learn from Jesus that though he easily could have held it against humanity and us for the rejection and for the ways in which we continue to sin time and time again, taking advantage of the grace that he's given us, to making his blood that he shed on the cross cheapened by the decisions that we make, even though he could easily say, forget you, I'm done with you, I've tried with you, but I'm over it. Jesus still gives us chance over and over again and says to us, even though you've rejected me, I still invite you to come and to have a place around my table. The generosity of God, the generosity of Christ is beautiful. I even think of the night that he was betrayed and as he broke the bread and as he passed around the cup to the disciples at the Last Supper, um, I find even there that Jesus shared that bread and that cup with Peter who would deny him three times. He shared the bread and the cup with Judas who would betray him. Um, And he offers that invitation, hospitality and love even to those who would be his enemies or betrayers or the ones that would deny him. Jesus models that for us. And as we prepare and study these stories, I think it's important for us to say, Lord, help me not just to go into this Christmas making sure I've checked everything off of the list. Help me to make sure that going into this Christmas, I'm not just focused on how nice my house looks or what it smells like or who's coming or not coming over, but Lord, help me in my own heart to prepare myself so that the Christmas that I experience is one that has transformed me into being more like the Savior that God gave us. I want to be more like Jesus this Christmas. Lord, more than what I'm hoping to get or receive off of my list, I want to be more like you, Jesus, on this Christmas. Forgive me, Lord, for the areas and ways in my life that I have yet to allow everything to be taken over and immersed by your character. Would you do a work in me on the inside. May this Christmas not be about the outside, but may may it be about the inside and what God wants to do in us. Amen? I want us to think about the birth announcements or the announcement. The angels came. Beautiful scene where we we have the angels that show up and and they declare a, a heavenly message about who this Jesus is. And who did they bring it to? They brought it to the shepherds, this audience who were to receive this message. The shepherds were given this beautiful proclamation of what God was doing in this very moment. And the shepherds uh, then came, and they came to verify and to confirm and to corroborate all that God was doing in that moment. And I want you to think about it this way. Prior to this moment, Mary and Joseph had received a message from the Lord that that all of this was from the Lord, that the Holy Spirit was orchestrating this. The Holy Spirit was doing this very thing, that the birth of Jesus was to be miraculous. And so they had received all of that, but it was very private at that point. They weren't able to share it very much. They weren't able to Facebook message it and have everybody see and hear. And they were holding it onto themselves. Maybe a few people in their inner circle had known about it, but it wasn't something that they could talk about openly. I don't know if you've ever had news before that you have to keep to yourself for one reason or another. You weren't able to share it. And that, that could be either a, a, a good thing or that could be really challenging to do, whether you have good news or bad news when you're trying to hold something into yourself and you're not able to share it. And man, uh, some of you are better at that than others, right? Some of you, when you have something that you just, you're trying to hold on to, you could tell by the way that you make your facial expressions. You're kind of like, ah, uh, you, you got something going on. What is it, right? And, and Mary and Joseph had to keep this thing inside. And then the shepherd showed up. And I want you to think for a moment. Again, similarly to how the manger should not necessarily be seen as a crib because they didn't sell them at, you know, Walmart and Target. 
in the baby aisle. If anything, they, they sold mangers at, you know, Home Depot or something. Some pet shop, <laughs> Petco, PetSmart. They didn't sell them at Babies R Us. Similarly to how the manger is just a humble and unlikely um, component of the Christmas story, the shepherds also were an unlikely group of people to bear this news. In fact, again, I mentioned earlier that Matthew and Luke tell the Christmas story from two different lenses. Matthew wants the reader. It's the same story, but it's all about the detail and what you're paying attention to. Matthew's attention to detail focuses on the royalty and the lineage of Jesus as the king. Matthew focuses hard, really heavily on those things. In fact, in Luke, we don't have any mention of the wise men or the magi that brought the gifts. And in Luke, we have no mention of the shepherds. Or excuse me, yeah, Matthew, we have no mention of the shepherds. Think about that. Isn't it interesting? Matthew's story is hoping for us to see how royal, how rich the lineage of Jesus is. And Luke is almost telling it from the opposite perspective, how humble and lowly, even poor, the origin stories of, of Jesus are. The shepherds were not known uh, to be people who were um, trustworthy. They were not known to be people who uh, were esteemed in society. And yet it's the shepherds that came to Mary and Joseph that allow for them to no longer hold this story inside their own little inner circle, but the shepherds exploded it. Mary and Joseph didn't send out birth invitations and announcements to let everybody know what happened. The shepherds did that for them. God used them in this beautiful way. In some ways, God ennobled these shepherds who otherwise would have been considered low, otherwise would have, considered, uh, would have been considered in society as those who are not uh, of any kind of worth. God used them and ennobled them to be part of this beautiful story. I love the way that Luke really focuses in on these kinds of origins of Christ because it reminds us that God is the God who sees the forgotten. God is the God who sees the marginalized God is the God who sees the oppressed. He hasn't forgotten those who think they've been forgotten. He hasn't left out those who think they've been left out. Uh, Luke's gospel story and even the beginning in these first couple chapters remind us that our Lord sees that. And not only that, but he used the shepherds to encourage Mary and Joseph's faith. Again, I mentioned they were filled with both hope and doubt. And when the shepherds showed up, all of a sudden we see that Mary says that she treasured these things in her heart. Their very presence, the very fact that they showed up, the very fact that they too had received a message from angels and from the Lord. If there was any doubt left in Mary and Joseph's mind, when the shepherds showed up, that doubt began to fade. And I want to encourage you, whatever doubt or fear that you're carrying with you, there are plenty of doubts and fears we try to mask them with all kinds of stuff, with smiles, with loud music, with good tasting food. But underneath all of that, there are doubts and fears. There's worries. There's concerns. There's junk. There's sin. There's brokenness. There's darkness. And rather than trying to mask all of that, my prayer, my hope is just as the Lord sent the shepherds to encourage Mary and Joseph, I pray that the Lord would continue to send angels and shepherds and others your way to encourage you so that you can lean more toward hope than toward doubt. More toward faith than toward fear. So, so God's greatest gift this Christmas um, might not necessarily be uh, an iPad. Um, it might not necessarily be... Um, whatever it was on your list, but, you know, God's greatest gift is undeserved grace, unmerited favor. Because of Jesus, our hope is restored. In him, we have true forgiveness, and in him, we can offer true forgiveness. Through Jesus, we're given reconciliation. We could be made one again with our creator. 
Through Jesus, we have redemption. He bought us back, even though we allowed ourselves to be sold into sin. Through Jesus, we see the beginning of the enemy's defeat. Through Jesus, lies are brought down. Through Jesus, oppression has to end. So the first Christmas gift was wrapped, not with wrapping paper and bows and ribbons, but in swaddling cloth. He was laid not under a tree, but in a lowly manger. And instead of bringing fleeting happiness and holiday cheer, the first Christmas gift brought peace to earth and goodwill to all far and near. God's greatest gift cannot be bought or ordered, but only received with an open heart, humility, and with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word on this beautiful Christmas Sunday. A reminder to us of the greatest gift that we could ever receive. And we open our hearts to receive your son, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that you came humbly. We thank you that you didn't forget about us. We thank you that you care for us so much to the point where you don't want us to get stuck on things and stuff and meaningless pursuits, but may this season be filled with something that truly transforms us from the inside out. Make us more like you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.